Okay, a uh, very good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this wonderful morning. Today is our pleasure to have Dr. Muhammad Faris Ismail. He is going to share his topic on nanocellulose, a uh, versatile green materials with huge applications. Nanocellulose extracted from the biomass material cellulose. It is a fiber of great interest in the field of material science and biomedical engineering. Recent advancements in nanotechnology have raised the attention on the use of cellulose as one of the most re reliable natural resources in fulfilling the continuous demand for renewable, eco-friendly, and sustainable materials. Their great biocompatibility and biodegradability render nanocellulose promising in biomedical applications. This trend, of non, uh, this trend of technology is also in line with global effort to reduce plastic and agricultural waste. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker. Toto Faris is senior lecturer from Faculty of Dentistry, Masai University. Uh, Masai University. He completed his PhD in the field of pharmac pharmacology from UITM in 2018. His dedication towards his research work has produced impressive number of publications while also serving as reviewer to SI in text journals. His recent research interests revolve around functional foods, bio, uh, bio, uh, bio nanomaterials, and cancer studies. If you have any questions to ask Dr. Farris today, you may drop your question at the comment section below. We will read out your question during Q&A session. Without further ado, Please welcome Dr. Faris. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wong, uh, for your kind introduction. Um, so the topic for today webinar will be nanocellulose. Yeah, it's a versatile green material with huge applications. Uh, yeah, uh, I believe uh, some of you are now uh, at home, uh, work from home. And I hope you are keeping well and stay safe uh, whenever you can yeah, follow the SOP as well. Okay. Uh, before I start my, uh, <coughs> uh, I say cancer lectures, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I think uh, Mr. Wong's already introduced myself. I've been graduated from Monash University and three and, and years ago, uh, I graduated with my bachelor degree at UITM. Um, yes, my research interests uh, revolve around the biomaterials. Uh, biomedicines and also some cancer studies and yeah uh, you can receive my research kit and go scholar for doing so my research publication um, however currently I'm publishing at rate of five or seven articles per year you know despite our busy schedule and I would like to take uh, an opportunity here to thank uh, to thanks at Masa University you know for not only providing us with sufficient support to pay the uh, article processing uh, charge uh, fee for publication and we also have enough financial support to keep the research alive at Masa University. You know, even with the grant money that we've been provided. And currently, I have about you know, 300 uh, thousands of uh, uh, Malaysia uh, research grant money from, uh, 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 I mean, granted from nationals and also uh, Masa University grants. 
Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, before I officially start my lecture today, because I'm not an expert in this field, and I'm just providing you some information and then some updates on the subject matter, which is uh, nanocellulose. Okay, so plastic, you know, as you, uh, as you know, is a synthetic polymers. Yeah, they are anthropogenic uh, contaminants. What I mean by anthropogenic contaminants is actually originate from the human activity. And that actually adversely affect the natural ecosystems. And not only that, that cause global warming and climate change, because there's a sudden increase in the consumption of fossil resources since the 20th century. And for the last decade, uh, scientists have been working on isolating these environment-friendly materials from the renewable resources. And there are a few like uh, polylactide, um, uh, poly, the poly, uh, what called polyhydroxy alkanoids, sorry, uh, and soy-based plastic. Uh, we have the starch plastic, and uh, and the focus today will be cellulosic plastics. And the cellulosic plastic is actually based on the cellulose, which are present in plant cell wall, you know, as the primary reinforcement component of the cell wall. And then we use it, and all of this has been used extensively in the food packaging. Uh, and as well as until the uh, construction material and pharmaceutical products. And the most recent that you can find today are focused on the cellulose, uh, cellulose itself, yeah? Because it's uh, abundantly available uh, uh, globally. And not only can be found in plants, it can also be found in algae, tunicates, and some bacteria. And the annual production for this uh, cellulose itself reached 10 to 100 trillion tons per year. However, only 60% are exported by industry. The rest are being thrown as a waste. And today, with Mina, I'm going to first introduce with you with the uh, nanocellulose and how the nanocellulose differ from the cellulose itself. Yeah? Uh, we're looking into the uh, properties, the nomenclature use, and type of a nanocellulose. And then we will look into the structure and the sources, uh, how this chemical structure contributes to the unique property of this material. And we also would like, uh, I also like to share with you the isolation methods, how this, uh, how the pure nanosolus powder or suspension can be extracted from the raw materials. The nano composite, how to prepare it, uh, and what are the products, the application use, um, I mean, by this uh, nano composite. Uh, what was, or, what, or else, or, I mean, in other words, and nanocellulose reinforced composites. Okay? And we are looking into the application itself by, uh, you know, by, by focusing on the biomedical applications. Okay. So we, uh, before we go further into this wonder material, as I described in my uh, synopsis, so let me share with you how this uh, fascinating polymer called cellulose. Uh, which is abundant, can be potentially modified and functionalized for industrial use. So not only nanocellulose, yeah, which is uh, nanocrystalline uh, nano cellulose, bacterial nanocellulose, and cellulose, nano -cellulose, all these are actually, uh, actually nanocellulose, but the cellulose can also produce uh, or generate other material like regenerated cellulose, cellulose hydrogel, uh, cellulose aerogel, and cellulose acetates. And all these are produced uh, using different methods and from a, a various uh, cellulose source. So now looking at nanocellulose, is how it differs from the cellulose. So well, looking at the photo here, the image here, the single plant cellulose fiber, you know, with uh, uh, you know, 30 micrometer and one to a millimeter length, consists of a numerous you know, cellulose uh, microfiber and nanocellulose actually intrinsically prepared from the plant cellulose fiber via a uh, few processes. And because of the numerous uh, hydrogen bonds are present between the cellulose microfibrils uh, and to form, uh, uh, it had to, be to, uh, to achieve a complete conversion to a nanocellulose require a large energy consumption and need to be uh, uh, going through a fibrillation process, which is a mechanical fibrillation process in water. 
And after that, there will be a very speed treatment of cellulose fiber just to break this uh, fiber home uh, and to generate its cellulose. So if the treatment could be, uh, you know, uh, proposed, sorry. The treatment, uh, the treatment, the work called here is actually a pre-treatment of the cellulose fiber. Uh, Yeah, you are uh, using acid hydrolysis to produce uh, the, the, the cellulose nanocrystals and also cellulose nanofibers. And uh, as you can see here, the cellulose, uh, okay, so any, any nanoscale material must have a size of less than 100 nanometers. And therefore, nanocellulose, when compared to cellulose, it's actually based on the nanoscales, uh, nano uh, scales, which is uh, less than 100 nanometers. And Yes, it's actually between uh, when you hit different forms of a nano cellulose, they are actually between uh, two to 100 nanometers of width, depending on the forms of the nano cellulose. And uh, nano cellulose, which is either isolated from the plant waste product, or which is can be by so by biochemically uh, produced in a lab, it holds many of the desirable properties, which is similar to cellulose. Uh, not only it's renewable and abundant, it also has a low density properties, it also a non-toxic and have, they are really biodegradable. However, this nanocellulose is, have some unique properties in their, in, in their nano, nano scale, uh, uh, met, nanometric scale uh, by uh, having excellent stiffness, you know, do you know that nanocellulose is very similar to glass fiber and also Kevlar? It's very stiff or it's lightweight and they have a highest uh, tensile strain up to 10 uh, gigapascal, which is greater than the cast ion and it's also ratio strength of the weight. It's an eight times higher than the standard steel. Uh, nanocellulose also has a uh, high tensile strength with a young nanocellulose in the range of 20 to 50 um, pressure with high surface area and it means it uh, will open up many promising uh, application that's the use of this nanocellulose and next they have a low coefficient in thermal expansion and all the crystal structure uh, because in nanocellulose they have a crystal structure that uh, that, 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 that actually uh, result in this lower thermal expansion coefficient because the structure, in crystal, uh, crystal structure of the NC half is extremely uniform. It is extremely uniform and structurally sound. Like diamond, they have the lowest known thermal expansion coefficient of all naturally uh, occurring materials, and it shows that this particular material have stronger internal bones, you know, and therefore they have a high melting point. Uh, this is the reason why you want to break this. Uh, these uh, bonds with the high vibrational energy. Yeah? And next would be the dimension, have a dimensional stability. They have a dimensional uh, stability. Something is wrong. Okay. <laughs> In other words, uh, it, uh, uh, this material is actually flexible. It has a good optical properties, yeah. Uh, especially it's, this material is transparent, which is good for the application of wound dressing. You know, as you can see, the healing process, yeah? and the, it's able to modify its surface chemistry. That makes this, uh, this material to be easily uh, functionalized for telemedicine application. Okay. Okay, let's look at the uh, uh, global market inside. So this nanocellulose market has been close to uh, 146 million in 2019. And it actually has, uh, we grow at a uh, uh, compound annual growth rates of 21.4% uh, uh, from 20 to 2026. 20, However, early market forecast uh, for 2025 is actually was 700 million. And I believe it's due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's been severely impacted the nanocellulose industry as well. And 
that's the how the pandemic severely hit the oil and gas industry uh, in early March uh, of 2020. And I believe the producers are now resolving the challenge here. And these are the benefits. Uh, I mean, we are talking, we, are, we already talked about the benefits of the nanostructure cellulose. And as I can say, it may open up new prospects in several applications. And there will be uh, nanocomposite materials, wood adhesive, biomedical products, supercapacitors, you know, can be used in all uh, as a template for electronic components, battery catalyst support, yeah, uh, food coatings, uh, antimicrobial film, as well as this uh, drug uh, transport, paper products, cosmetic and cements. Some of these have been used and has been commercialized, while some of these are still imaging, uh, uh, imaging. Is still emerging. Eh? Okay, now if you read the literature about nanocellulose, the several terminologies have been used, and you now to define this nanocellulose and uh, called cellulose nanomaterial, and it sometimes causes misunderstanding and inequities. So, for years ago, uh, the Technical uh, Association of the Park Paper Industry Company. Yeah, as established in the technology division, just to dedicate and standardize, uh, uh, just to, to standardize the nomenclature of the cellulose nanomaterials. And uh, according to a draft version of uh, TAPI W1 3021, uh, standard terms on and the definition for cellulose nanomaterials, they have actually categorized uh, nanocellulose into uh, nanostructured materials. And nanofibers. And the first category includes the microcrystalline cellulose and the cellulose microfibers, whereas the second one comprises of cellulose nanocrystal, cellulose nanofiber, and bacterial cellulose. So, next, I will just focus on the nanofibers, which firstly we have cellulose nanocrystal. It produced by acid hydrolysis, it consists of this uh, cylindrical. Uh, cylindri Cylindrical, elongated, less flexible, like a nanoparticle, with four to seven nanometer in width, uh, with hundred and six thousand nanometer in length, and it has uh, fifty-four to eighty-eight percent of crystalline index, and it actually receives a, a number of names also before it being uh, standardized as cellulose nanocrystal. Before this, we call it as a nanocrystalline cellulose. We call it as a road light cellulose crystal, nano wires, nano roads. Sometimes we call it nano balls, yeah? And recently, there's the confused with cellulose nano whiskers, CNW, yeah? Or cellulose whiskers. And yeah, we should stick with one, which is, uh, I think, uh, describing the same thing, which are cellulose nanocrystal. Next will be a nanofibrillated cellulose, or we call it cellulose nanofibrils, you know. It's actually mechanical, uh, it can be obtained through a mechanical treatment. Uh, just just a mechanical treatment, yeah, we can actually uh, isolate this nanofibrillated cellulose. Uh, it's present, it's an entangled uh, uh, network structure with flexible and a longer, you know, white nanofibers. They have a 220 to 100 nanometer in width yeah, and uh, more than, uh, well, of course, uh, more than thousands in length. You know, they also show uh, low crystallinity with respect to uh, C, uh, CNC or cellulose nanocrystal because nanocrystals has been uh, going through a lot of treatment to remove all the uh, non-cellulose components of the cellulose. Okay. And the CNF is, uh, have been used, uh, 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 have, uh, have been described by different names as well, like uh, nanofibrous cellulose, nanofibrous cellulose. So basically, uh, now we are calling them cellulose nanofibrous. Other than that, uh, there's a bacterial nanocellulose, and as the name is fly, it's actually coming from or actually can be isolated from a bacteria. Yeah, it's a consider uh, very promising and cost effective for biomedical application. Uh, morphological wise, it's ultra fine, pure, and have a ribbon shaped nano, uh, nano fibers. Yeah, they have uh, 20 to 100 nanometer in diameter. 
with a micrometer sum of length. Uh, it's actually entangled to produce a three-dimensional network. You know, yeah, it's a hallmark of this uh, uh, so, uh, bacterial nanocellulose. Okay, now, uh, now as you know, the native cellulose is composed, uh, the information and yeah, native cellulose is composed of both ordered, which is the crystalline structure, and this ordered domains, we call it amorphous. Yeah? And the crystallinity can, of this cellulose, nanocellulose can vary from 40 to 70% depending on the natural source and as well as the extraction procedure. And here are the hierarchy structure of tree from the micro scale to a nano scale. A whole tree can be up to 100 meters across and the cross section of this contained structure on the uh, centimeter scale and the growth ring, you know, measuring the millimeters. And then the cellular anatomy is 10 micrometers. Yeah. The configuration of the hemocellulose and lignin in the cellulose microphone measure tens of uh, nanometers. And the molecular structure of the cellulose is actually nan it's nanometric. The fiber contains, as I mentioned, crystalline, uh, crystalline uh, and amorphous region. Yeah? So this amorphous is preferably degraded to release nanoscale components of uh, nanocellulose because it's prone to react with other molecular group that may actually disrupt its property. So the cellulose is actually uh, composed of this repeating unit called cellulose. It's a dimer uh, of a D-glucose. Yeah? Uh, and this linear B the glycopyranose units actually linked together by beta 1 4 linkage to produce yeah, uh, a crystalline structure of cellulose known as elementary fibrils. So, this is elementary fibrils. Yeah. So, these elementary fibrils will be bundled together to produce microfibrils, then form the microfibrils and form a cellulose fibers. And one of these uh, most distinguished uh, useful characteristic of the cellulose is the high degree of hydroxylation along the you know, polymer chain and each non-thermal normal contains uh, these three hydroxyl groups. And hydrogen bonding arises between uh, these hydrogen groups convenient position with the same cellulose uh, molecule. We call it as uh, intra uh, molecules. Yeah, the green color arrow and between neighboring cellulose change we call it intermolecular bonds. Yeah, and this intermolecular hydrogen bond will create the fiber structures and semi crystalline packing. And then it's govern the physical property of the cellulose and then explain its high strength and flexibility. Okay. So cellulose with uh, different features can be obtained depending on the natural source uh, or either its origin and then uh, its origin, yeah? Other than you no know, maturity process, the treatment and also the processing of the words. But uh, this, is, uh, this table shows the various source of nanocellulose and it can be grouped into hardwood, uh, softwood, uh, animal plants or agricultural residue, can be actually grouped into animal, you know, the animal also produce cellulose, bacteria, and the algae. So these are different, different source of nanocellulose that you can get from. Yeah. And uh, for my past publication, more of my previous research, of my previous research, uh, I published two research articles based on the isolation of nanocellulose from the Josephine pineapple leaf fiber and as well as this nanocellulose from indica rice straw. Yeah. So we specifically mentioned the uh, genus of the uh, plant, the Josephine, because the, the, the source or the, uh, of the uh, of nanocellulose uh, can be different based on geophory, I mean, a geo graphical region, yeah? And this, the first one actually uh, we isolated, isolated the cellulose from, I mean, uh, from the uh, pinnacle fiber using alkyl treatment, and it resulted in the CNF, we call it uh, cellulose nanofiber, 
And then for the second one, it's actually we uh, managed to isolate nanocellulose, or in other words, it's crystalline uh, cellulose thermocrystal uh, using acid hydroxide. And this is how our uh, first uh, uh, CNF will be produced using a country man as of aging. Uh, yeah. okay. Now we let's look into the different method of uh, isolating cellulose nano crystal. And we give this emphasis only to the cellulose nano crystal because, of course, we're going to discuss all the nano cells type. It will take uh, quite a while. Yeah. So, generally, the preparation of nano cellulose uh, from cellulose requires two main stages. The first focus on the treatments of the feedstock to obtain pure cellulose, uh, whereas the second stage, uh, stage is dedicated to the transformation of cellulose to nanocellulose. And during the first stage, the you know the extractive, uh, the monomers or the dimers and the polymers of fat, free sugar, tannins, uh, all these molecules, uh, amicellulose, lignin, have to be partially or totally eliminated from the uh, raw material. Uh, based on the specific pre-treatment methods. And the second stage is usually dedicated to the production of cellulose and crystal. Yeah? It's the hydrolysis that ensure the elimination of the amorphous domains from the pristine cellulose and uh, give rise to the production of CNC yeah? with a relatively high crystallinity. Yeah? And the acid use can be uh, any acid, this is sulfuric, uh, is it uh, hydrochloric? Or they are also using some organic solvent or organic acid. Yeah. Uh, we concern due, uh, due to concern due to environmental concern. And after the second stage, there's a further post treatment like uh, solvent elimination, uh, neutralizations, uh, dialysis to so just remove the free acid and you know, some surface modification, stabilization, drying uh, method, either freeze drying or spray drying, yeah, be undertaken just to uh, gain weight. Of course, uh, the extraction methods. As, uh, as you can see, this is the different method used to exfoliate the nanocellulose from the waste wood uh, material. You can can be classified into four different categories, uh, which is a physical, chemical, uh, and a biological approach or methods, and as well as the combined approach, where it's combined uh, two or one, or uh, two or three uh, approach together. Yeah. Uh, and, and and as we've mentioned, the chemical methods has been the most widely used expression methods to obtain this nanocellulose especially from the forest uh, residue yeah uh, and you know some methods are shorter and others are longer uh, some are environmentally uh, uh, pinning whereas others are not some are economic and some are less effective while others are efficient but they are, can be expensive as well yeah and this is actually my uh, latest research article published in volume engineering and science where we uh, so we isolate the nanocellulose or uh, cellulose nanocrystal from indica rice straw. Uh, let me just brief you how we did it. Actually, from the rice straw chips, it's loaded into uh, the rotary digester. And then we add anthraquinone dye. And then we add uh, sodium chloride uh, for the bleaching and sodium hydroxide. And this process has been, uh, we take about uh, seven, I mean, we, have, we need to repeat for seven times. And to get this, what we call lyo cells, uh, we have to disperse them into NMO solutions. And lastly, to produce the CNC, uh, the fiber hydro, hydrolyzed with acid hydrochloride. Yeah. So this is actually basically the process. It's quite lengthy. I mean, it's uh, it's really it's really uh, uh, exhaustive, yeah. But at the end, you get the very pure CNC for, uh, products, yeah. Okay. 
Now let's look at surface modification of why why it's needed, you know? because uh, because of this hydrophilic nature of the nanocellulose, there are exist there are many hydroxide groups in the surface, and the surface chemistry can be tuned chemically, physically, uh, chemically or through a physical interaction and biological approach, uh, and that will result with uh, with, uh, with surface functionalization. Uh, which can be prepared uh, during the preparation step or after the production of the nanocellulose. And it can be done through incorporation of any chemical uh, functionality. The surface of nanocellulose matrix can be modified the way it reacts with the foreign substance depending on the application of choice. Yeah? So this modification leads to uh, attaining desired properties that in turn enhance the effectiveness for a given application. Uh, and as you can see, there's uh, there are a few approach chemical. There are for chemical they have esterification, crafting methods, uh, depot mediated oxidation, sulfonation, silation, and transfer sterification. Okay. For physical, yeah, some are using desert treatment, iodine treatment, or corona treatment, plasma treatment, and as well as flame treatment. For enzymatic, it can be a direct function using a uh, phosphorylation via exokinase or indirect enzymatic functionalization uh, can be grafted using an active molecule. Okay. And now when you have this uh, surface modified nanocellulose or non-modified cellulose, it can now be, be um, uh, mixed together with other monomers or biomaterials to produce a nanocomposite. Okay, so what is nanocomposite? It's actually a heterogeneous mixture which contains two or more different components, which uh, sub uh, which will result in substantial uh, will result in the various uh, physical chemical features, and by definition, it also consists of a homogeneous uh, matrix like polymer or bipolymer that is reinforced by a stiffer and stronger component that with a small amount of you know, nano size or organic mineral fillers or cellulose yeah the end result And then you will result with uh, something that we call nanocellulose and false polymer composite. And normally we are not using two acid uh, composite, epoxy nanocomposite, uh, as well as the polystyrene nanocomposite, where this nanocellulose has been introduced as the reinforcing agent. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a different method. Of yeah, uh, for uh, to produce a cellulose fiber or nanocellulose reinforced by composite. Uh, first method we hand elimination. Uh, uh, the RTM process, the compression molding, injection molding, or we can use full pressure molding. So in my paper in the rice for for the rice straw uh, nanocellulose, at the end we actually try to measure the uh, mechanical strength of this. Uh, Nanocellulose reinforced uh, apposite composite. Yeah, we call it apposite exposy laminate using Kevlar. Yeah, uh, as the base. Yeah, to see whether there is any improvement in the strength, or we call it as in the stress strength, uh, in the tensile strength. Uh, okay, and what we found is the tensile strength of the composite had increased up to three times. Yeah. Uh, and the what we call the elasticity, uh, the elasticity uh, of this uh, composite has also increased by uh, three times. Yeah, when compared to the uh, the Kevlar alone. Yeah. So, so this is another uh, approach where we can uh, process the non-composite using layer by layer assembly. Either through a massive uh, spin or spray method, 
and as well as this one port directed uh, assembly approach uh, and the cast strength approach other than that there be there are, there are uh, fiber spinning or free strength approach uh, fiber spinning or called atro spinning uh, we actually have a uh, 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 one paper I already submitted to cellulose during the under review using a uh, rubber nanocellulose uh, method uh, which prepared by this ultra spinning uh, method yeah and I hope it can get published soon also this is a state of art application for new for new uh, nanocellulose composite yeah uh, where nanoslose has been used as reinforcing agents and you can see here there's many applications of this nanocellulose reinforced application uh, i mean reinforced composite uh, and today i'm just going to highlight few uh, which focus on the biomedical applications so Let's look at the first application of this nanocellulose in composite, uh, and how it can how it contributes to the uh, the production or generation of biological implants. First example would be this uh, BASYC. It's a bacterial synthesized cellulose. We call it the beta cellulose tubes. Yeah, you see there are different. They have prepared a different dimension of these uh, beta cellulose tubes that can be. Uh, they can be applied in the uh, uh, in the what we call uh, generation of prosthesis. Okay, and this is one of the example here: yeah, vascular prosthesis made of uh, cellulose nanofibrils, where it be used together with polyurethane composite. Uh, this vascular prosthesis was placed uh, between this uh, brachiocephalic triangle and the right common carotid artery in a male patient yeah. and it's also crucial that the nanosolus so, um, materials have these anti-thrombogenic properties to avoid the blood clotting especially when uh, generating this kind of prosthesis uh, and to achieve this, uh, this anti-thrombogenic properties the endothelial cells have been used to produce a non tropogenic uh, interface between the blood and nanocellulose composite used in these implants. Yeah? It can be either through inoculation of these uh, endothelial cells onto the material itself or through modification of the non composite with feature that can stimulate these uh, uh, endothelial cells recruitment from the surrounding tissue. And as you know, endothelial cells are made up of cell lining of the endothelium in the native blood vessel. It, uh, create the smooth non thrombogenic surface and a part of this role in the regulation of the blood coagulation and fibrinolysis it also possess an extraordinary array of function like uh, control the vesicle tone local blood flow and initiation and modulation of the inflammatory response but how yeah by can be done by inserting the cell addition of peptide into the nanocellulose and this see this is a comparison between a pig meniscus yeah? on the left and the vitreal uh, cellulose hydrogel on the right. So, uh, the meniscus is actually a C-shaped piece of, uh, you know, tough rubbery cartilage, yeah, that acts as a shock absorber between your shin bone and thigh bone. Yeah? And there's also you now a recent uh, three-dimensional printing technology. Yeah? You can also offer a means to create a customized or patient specific implants and as you can see here uh, the negative uh, silicon mold were prepared uh, to guide the bacteria during the bacterial culture and to produce a large scale features of the outer ear on the left and the 3d uh, printing printed uh, beta cellulose implant prototype were also produced in the shape of a whole year, outer year, according to the 3D MRI scanning technique. And this BNC was used to design an ear shaped structure that uh, could be utilized to develop a complete human ear with specific size and shape when you use this kind of, uh, I mean, this, techno this uh, you know, 3D technology. 
and by looking at this you know uh, this composite can hold tremendous potential uh, for future regenerative therapy yeah talking about tissue tissue regeneration yeah? or tissue engineering you know? this nc has shown uh, some of uh, a good outcome uh, in, in, in production of scaffold especially that comprise of nanocellulose and this scaffold have a great efficacy for bone and cartilage uh, regeneration and it's allow various type of cell to adhere uh, and develop into desired tissue and organs and uh, the, the typical bone regeneration by using uh, by the nanocellulose uh, you know this uh, scaffold uh, it's been used as a repair material and there's a evaluation of this non-critical bone defect in the red tibia uh, with the BNC membrane which then they show no inflammatory action with defects while the, uh, the defects were completely filled by the new bone tissue after only four weeks and similar results also obtained uh, from stud other study using a red skull uh, and they show a new bone formation on the marginal center of the bone after eight weeks of the implant. Yeah. Uh, the cellulose nanofiber can also be used to, uh, you know, as an ideal drug delivery uh, material to encapsulate and carry some drugs. And therefore, uh, it can also carry a transport uh, some of the uh, uh, called, uh, scaffold, I mean a drug into the scaffold. Okay. So like for example in this study, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, different, different study that have been conducted uh, on, uh, on, I mean with use, using a better nanocellular scaffold in the tissue engineering. There are also studies have been done on the calvary defected bone, nasal dorsum bone, femoral cortical bone tendon, and also uh, some have been done in parental tissue. And in, uh, for favor for my uh, fellow colleague in faculty of dentistry, so I'm uh, putting this one of good example that carried that just recently published in on March, yeah, uh, where they are incorporating magnesium oxide, nano particles in the polycarpolectone uh, uh, gelatin or shell nanocellulose uh, per, uh, for, for a parental uh, membranes. Okay. So uh, based on the result, it shows that, that this uh, composite or membranes made of uh, better nanocellulose, uh, nanocellulose uh, it show better human periodontal ligament stem cell proliferation rates, you know? and one of the one of the shows that it have a stronger effect on the surgeon association of this uh, human periodontal ligament stem cell (HPDLSC). And my current study also uh, currently an, uh, ongoing. Um, the, the, the study was con uh, will, is conduct is will be conducted by my PhD students, the DRD students, where this nanocellulose will be used to reinforce the, the dental resourcing materials. Okay, now let's look into how this uh, CNF parogel used as a wound, uh, in the wound healing applications. Because wound healing is very complex and pressure process as is susceptible to infection that may deteriorate the tissue and slow down the healing process. So, and this can be um, caused by the bacterial infection, uh, especially during the first 48 to 78 hours. And that can contribute to non-healing or chronic wounds. And nanosolid is not only efficient as a physical barrier against the external infection, but it can also form a porous network structure in the material scaffold deliver the antibiotics or other medication into the wound. And like, for example, this study, uh, they produce a cellulose nanofibrils uh, through, um, by means of tempo mediated oxidation method. And 
it, it's uh, introduced polydopamine uh, PDA into this uh, network and fabricate them into uh, nanocellulose, uh, I mean, and fabricate into a hydrogel through using calcium ion as a crosslinker. And this hydrogel were used as in both uh, wound healing application as well as in drug uh, delivery. And uh, I'm, I'm focusing now on the wound healing application as you can see in the result. Yeah. The, the, the what we call the, the composite containing this uh, polydopamine, uh, polydopamine yeah, have shown a better recovery uh, uh, on, the, on, on the wound healing uh, compared to others or other groups. And one of the added advantage of this um, cellulose or you know, C, CNF hydrogel uh, is that it's uh, they are actually transparent where you can see the healing process and it can also put away once healing has occurred due to non biodegradable because it's uh, highly biodegradable. Okay, that is all about the biomedical application of the nanocellulose. Well, uh, as you can hear, that just I guess, uh, just now. The reported study of this nanocellulose had led to a significant advancement uh, with the promise of even greater advance, which likely to come in the near future. And no doubt, this nanocellulose has a great potential for the breakthrough of the, uh, this material in various applications, especially in biomedical industry. And how about this challenge uh, relates to the use of this uh, nanocellulose in this industry? Uh, okay, first, well, the first thing will be the isolation of the nanocellulose itself. It's require a high amount of acid wastewater. I mean, require a high amount of acid that will lead to generation of acid wastewater, uh, uh, and then it help. It, it require high energy utilization for the mechanical process and it can also cause the elevated reaction duration for the enzymatic catalysis. And one of the other challenges is how to upscale the BNC production because the upscaling of the BNC production requires high cost in the production media and the growth maintenance of this uh, you know, uh, uh, petrocellulose producing microbial stream. And, they, they, and even that, it, can, it only can produce a very low yield. Yeah? Uh, part of that is also relates to the uh, toxicity concern. Uh, as, as, as far as we know, these cellulose are actually non-toxic and non-genotoxic. However, when we do or we, we do a chemical modification or introduce any chemical into the non-cellulose, it may cause complication, yeah? especially when we use it in, uh, for a biomedical application. Like for example, the study showed that addition, addition of the, the diet other high groups to the nanocellulose can cause uh, enhanced gene expression of tumor necrosis factor and also induce inflammation at the side. And another study shows that the bacteria are derived nanocellulose might contain contamination of unwanted like oh, polysaccharide that may cause inflammation at the side as well. So this is a challenge that we need to take, uh, need to um, solve before uh, we can celebrate, yeah? fully celebrate the, use, the, 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 use, the usefulness of the cellulose. Okay, uh, on all all, this ID material can, uh, should have a control properties and surface functionalization with tune form and dispersion within this material to, in order to be further exported in, uh, in, 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 in other emerging uh, application. And yes, there's still uh, plenty to discover. And uh, with that, uh, I, I end my uh, session today. Sorry. Let's see. Okay. So uh, thank you, Dr. Fares, for your very informative and very comprehensive presentations. Uh, now we come to our short Q&A session. If uh, audience, you have any question, you may drop your 
questions in, in the comment section below. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, I have one uh, question to Dr. Faris. As you mentioned, the challenge to apply the nanocellulose as an alternative material in uh, real life due to the, the, the like what you mentioned, the low yield, the high cost, and the safety concern of the nanocellulose. So, uh, and any, what are the future direction of uh, research to uh, tackle these uh, challenges? Any any direction of research that we, we, we are doing or any any crew that what a current research try, trying yeah. to do to tackle this? Yeah, okay. So, of course, there are, the researchers are trying to resolve the what are called shortcomings of these all methods that require uh, acids, require um, uh, uh, very uh, not inefficient, uh, um, inefficient kind of methods that produce a low yield of uh, cellulose. And, and that's where uh, we can see in current literature that are actually try to uh, change the directions towards uh, another methods like uh, steam expulsion methods, um, like uh, tempo mediated oxidation uh, methods. That is how I can say, uh, although they, they have a high operational cost, but uh, but they are, can uh, reduce, you know, in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, uh, event, environmental uh, concern that we are facing now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there is a lot of other methods actually that we can uh, explore, and you can read more um, the methods uh, and what is the uh, pro and cons using the methods. And based on that, we can actually uh, decide which one to go for a large scale production of this nanocellulose. Yeah. Okay. So okay. thank you, thank you so for us. I think we have no other question from the audience. So before we end the question, actually we have a small survey form. Yeah. Okay. So as you can see, the there is a QR code projected on my screen. So uh, so you may scan the QR code with your phone to fill up the forms. Uh, your feedback is very important for us to improve our webinar series in the future. You may provide your contact information so that you won't miss the future events organized by MASA. So lastly, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Faris to spend his morning with us and thank you everyone. Hope you all uh, learned something useful today. Uh, have a nice day.